said this, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. So it really doesn't matter how your day looked or your week looked. You, you can be glad. David said that I can be glad going to the house of the Lord because that's when I come in contact with the presence of God. That's when all your problems, uh, God brings a solution to every one of your problems. Can you say amen? God is a solution provider. He's not a burden bringer. He's a burden breaker. Jesus said, come to me all that are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. We don't go to church to add a burden. We don't go to church to add more problems to the people. We come to church to meet together because there's a tangible, there's a tangible presence of God when the people of God meet together. And then Jesus, by the anointing, Isaiah 10, 27, he lifts up the burdens and he destroys every yoke of captivity. You know, it doesn't say, a lot of people misquote that. They say that the anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing doesn't break the yoke because you can repair something that's broken. You can't repair something that's destroyed. It's like if I went to your house and I took like your fine china and I just cracked it on my knee and it split in half. You can repair that. You get some good crazy glue or whatever and you can maybe bring it to a professional artist and they can, they can like pretty much repair that. But if I came to your house and got your fine china and took a, like a, a sledgehammer to it and I just started knocking on it till it was dust, you won't won't find anybody in the world that can repair that. It's destroyed. That's what the anointing does. It doesn't break the yoke of the devil so that he can come back and put it back on you. He destroys the yoke of the devil so that it's impossible for the devil to lay it back on you. That's why Jesus said, whom the Son sets free is free and free indeed. Can you shout hallelujah? Second Corinthians chapter 12. This is what Paul says. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Everybody say revelation. I know a man in Christ. Everybody say in Christ. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows such a one was caught up into the third heaven. I want to focus on the word in Christ tonight. Paul, because if you study, you know, any type of theological book, they're going to tell you that that was Paul speaking of himself, but he was trying to be humble and not bring up his name. But that was Paul speaking of himself. And he doesn't say, I know a man, I, you know, I know a man who's got good standing with God, but it, no, it, it doesn't say, I know a man who, who knows Christ. It says, I know a man who is in Christ, a man in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ Jesus? The Bible says that, I mean, if you study it, there are over 130 in Christ statements all throughout the Bible. And there are 36 in Christ or in Him statements that are like extremely, extremely valuable and every believer should pay attention to to them, and I'm not going to go through them all tonight. But you know, you have the the scripture in, in First Second Corinthians one and thirty. It says that every promise of God is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. So just to give an idea of what I'm talking about, the in Christ statements are extremely important, and believers have to pay attention. Because if you don't understand your identification with Christ because of new birth, because you've been born again, you're going to live a life no different than anybody else who lives in the world because you're going to just bunch yourself in the same category. You're not in the same category anymore. I said you're not in the same category as unbelievers anymore. When you were born again, the Bible says you were born from above and you've become above all. The scripture says, actually turn there, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. This is why the epistles of Paul are so important. Because Paul, when he writes his epistles, he's not writing them as a book of promises that here are things that you can believe God for, or here are things that God will give you if you just trust Him long enough. The, the epistles of Paul, specifically, in the New Testament, are designed in such a way to show or reveal what Jesus did at the cross and it lists off a bunch of things that aren't things we have to strive to obtain, but things that believers in Christ have already. And so it's important to know, you know, obviously who Christ is and His power, but then to understand 
that Christ is not some separate entity of himself. That there's Jesus and then there's us lowly folk that are here on the earth and one day he's going to rescue us and we'll finally join him in heaven again. That's not what the, the epistles of Paul. The epistles of Paul show you, and I'm going to read it in just a second, that there's Christ in heaven and then we are seated where? In Christ, in heavenly places, at the same place of authority, far above principality, far above power. Uh, every power that is named not only in this age, but also in the age to come. So people that don't, that don't have that click in their brain, there are, you know, there's a lot of Christians that they've been either taught wrong or they're trying to be falsely humble and say, you know, well, you know, he's Jesus, you know, he's in a class by himself. We're just lowly scum here on the earth. And one day, you know, we, no, he is the head. We are the what? The body of Jesus Christ. And so the head and the body aren't separated. The head and the body don't share different levels of authority or dominion. Jesus, who defeated Colossians 2.14, he destroyed the devil, made a public show of him openly. Matter of fact, there's a translation that says he spoiled the devil and all his plans. He spoiled the devil and all his plans. And then the Bible says after he did that, you know, when he died, he wasn't just in that tomb with his arms crossed waiting for something to happen. He was at work. There was something happening between his death and his resurrection. The Bible says he went down to the lowest. He found the devil's headquarters. He cracked the devil's head open, took the devil, the, the keys of death, hell, and the grave, raised up on high, and the Bible says he appeared before the Father with his own blood into the most holy place so that we can have right standing with God. And because we have right standing, which that's what we get the word righteousness from. Righteousness just means right standing with God. Because we have right standing with God now, we can be connected. The Bible says that we are joined to the Lord and we have become one spirit with Jesus Christ. I mean, those are power. That, it doesn't say that you're divided from Christ. It doesn't say that Christ is in a league of his own, and then you have to pretty much sort things out on the earth. No, you have been joined to Jesus, and you've become one spirit with him. That's why Galatians 2.20, Paul says, it is no longer I who lives. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. And it's no longer I that lives. Who lives? Christ lives in me. You have to carry that oneness mentality, that you are one with Christ. That union with Christ mentality. That I'm not separated. I, I know this might sound simple for some of you, but there's a lot of people that this hasn't clicked in their noggin. And that's why every time a problem arises, they panic. Every time the devil rears his ugly head, they panic. Instead of understanding that I, you know, that's why John in 1 John 4 said, you aren't to fear the devil because you've already overcome him. You understand this? That when Christ died and was buried, Romans 6 says we were buried with him in baptism in conformity to his death. Do you think Jesus had to die for his problems? He didn't have any problems. He was in heaven triumphing already. He died for our sins. Then the Bible says he was raised to life not because he needed an extra victory. He, are, he was already one who was seated in heavenly places before he even entered onto planet earth. So he didn't raise, rise again for his own, his own victory or triumph. He rose again so that we too, you have to see yourself this way. When Christ died, I died in Christ. And when Christ rose again, I rose again with Christ. And then take it a step further. When Christ was raised up to be seated at the highest place at the right hand of the Father, I was raised up to be seated in Him at the right hand of the Father in a place of victory, triumph, and dominion. Jesus' victory is now conferred on you and becomes your victory. Jesus' triumph of the cross has become your triumph. And that's the reason, that's what separates, I find, there's like a great division in Christianity. That's what separates the boys from the men. That's what separates the people that constantly live in this cycle of frustration, this cycle of defeat, this cycle, I need delivered, I need help, I need, sa you know, I don't know if I'm saved, I don't know, because they haven't, you know, God's not a liar. He wouldn't fill this book with all kinds of in Christ, this is what you are in Christ, here's what you have in Christ. 
And then just back off and say, oh, hey, hey you're, you're getting ahead of yourself. You know, I knew I said some things in there, but I was a little excited that day. Really, you got to put the brakes, hit the brakes, slow down a little bit because there's a lot of things in there that, you know, you'll only get one day when you make it to heaven. No. Everything, say this out of your mouth. Everything the Bible says I can have, I can have. What it says I can do, I can do. What it says I can say, I can say. That's right. You're never wrong when you quote God. Because there's some things you, you, read in Christ, you read in Christ statements. If I were to say some of them tonight, you'd be like, well, that's blasphemy. Well, it's in there. And you're not wrong when you quote God. You're never wrong when you quote God. How many of you know we're nothing and he's everything? You know, every time you, t because you're in Christ, you know, John 15 says, abide in me and I will what? Abide in you. For, uh, Colossians 1.27 says this, this is, a, this is a mystery that I have for you Gentiles. Christ is now in you, the hope of glory. Oh, hallelujah. You know what that word mystery means in the original Greek? It means something that you've never ever witnessed before. Something that has, has been even foreign to the Jews in the history of the Jews and their knowledge of God. That's what Paul was saying. He's not saying it's something complex to understand. What he was saying, it's something fresh, something new, something that's never been heard of. And it's, this is the mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not Christ beside you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, test yourself to know whether you're in the faith. Or do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? Say, Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Hallelujah. Man, if you'll catch this one nugget, you will carry a new level of boldness in your own life. Boldness in your dealing with the devil. You won't tolerate his mess in your life anymore. You won't just say, well, you know, sometimes, some, you know, we're not promised victory here. You won't, you won't tolerate it. Because when you see... When you see yourself in Christ and your identity in Christ, then when you start to read the Gospels, they take on a whole new meaning for you. Because what you read Jesus did through the Gospels, you know that now you're empowered to do in this post-Gospel era. You don't see Jesus as some museum that we visit and we look at and say, oh, isn't it nice what he did then? Pro, look, he healed the sick, he cast out devils. Do you know that Luke chapter 10 says, behold, I, Jesus told his disciples which that means you too. He says, I have called you and anointed you to cast out demons and all unclean spirits, to trample on serpents and scorpions, which represents the powers of the devil. Not to be trampled by those things, but to trample those things because they're not over your head. They're under your feet now because of your position in Christ. So now you read the Gospels and you start to see your, if, you know, Jesus, John 14, 12. He that believes on me, the works you've seen me do, what did he say? You will do and greater works will you do. You'll do greater works. Why could he say that with absolute boldness? Because he knew there was a day coming where he said, now you have the spirit that abides with you, uh, by you. Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost. He, ab he abode by the disciples. But once Jesus died and went to heaven, raised from the dead and went to heaven, he told the disciples, I'm going to send you the helper. The same spirit that's in me is going to come in you. The spirit of Christ alive in the believer so that the works you've seen me do, you can do them on the earth and greater works will you do because I'm going to the Father. Hallelujah. And so the Holy Spirit's ministry many times well, Jesus said in John 16, he'll guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit is a tour guide. And the Bible is like, you ever go to like the Louvre Museum or something or some sort of museum? And you go and visit the museum and, and you have a tour guide and he guides you to, you know, the Louvre. There's like, I think, seven miles worth of, of things to look at. But everyone goes for the, Mono, the Mona Lisa and the Da Vinci. So you don't want to waste, you know, you only have so much time. You don't want to waste all your time looking at minor things. You want to go... You want to go see Da Vinci. You want to go see the Mona Lisa. So the tour guide guides you through that, and then he explains everything. The Bible is, it's not a museum in the sense that you look at it and, you, oh, wow, those are the relics of the past. 
But you can see it as a type of museum that shows, and then the Holy Spirit is your tour guide, that shows and reveals everything that God has made you to be in Christ Jesus. He shows you every exhibit. This is what, you know, J James chapter 1 says it this way. That you, when you look into the word, you're looking into a mirror as to what you're supposed to look like. And he said, James admonishes the believers of his day. He says, don't look in the mirror and then forget what you look like. Don't read this book as if it's like a, a you know, Time Magazine article. Don't read it and then totally detach and have your thoughts far from it. Meditate on its truths and continue therein. And James said, when you continue in the perfect law of liberty, that's when the blessing kicks in and you start to see victory. So the, the word is like a mirror that reveals what you look like now that you've been born again into the family of God. Did everyone die like three minutes ago? I feel like everyone just like, I don't know what he's saying. It's actually the most simple thing in the Bible, what I'm saying right now. And if this doesn't get you excited, then nothing in the scripture will. Because the whole gospel revolves around this. The gospel is literally God sending Jesus. You know, Jesus didn't go through the agony of the cross and go through the torture and crucifixion being spat on and mocked and scourged only so that you could, you know, have things a little better in life. Just so you can be in better shape. He didn't do it to renovate you. He didn't do it so that you can be reformed a bit. A bit. He didn't do it so that you could have a, a little better of a chance in life now. The Bible says if any man is in Christ Jesus, that man has become a new creation. What's that new creation? It's Christ, the old you dead, the new you is Christ in you emerging, working in and through you to accomplish his good pleasure on the earth. Hallelujah. And that's why I'm convinced a lot of preachers don't even understand this. And that's why their sermons are dusty and dull. Because you can't grab a mic and start talking about this and not get fired up. It's too good of a... That's why it's called the Evangelium. The good news. Not, hey, life's going to be a bit better now. Hey, you won't have... That's how some people preach the gospel. Hey, you won't have to go through life alone now. That's not why Jesus died. So you wouldn't have to go through life alone. I could have made a friend. I wouldn't have had to go through life alone. Jesus didn't die so you can have companionship. You hear some of these guys' altar calls. If you're feeling lonely today, why don't you just come to this altar and we got some people that are equipped. They're going to pray for you. And That's not an altar call. When we're inviting people to Christ, we're inviting them to be born again into the family of God, whereby the old Jew is crucified with Christ and the scripture says, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ now lives in and through you. It's a totally, totally new everything. Bible doesn't say some things are past, but you're still going to have to deal with them. But mostly everything's going to become new. All things are past. Everything. Say everything. everything. Everything becomes new. So Ephesians 1 and verse 17. This is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian church. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The eyes of your understanding being opened. So that's what he's saying. I, I pray that you can catch this revelation. That's in modern vernacular, that's what he would be saying. I pray that you can catch this. I pray that the light bulb goes on on this. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe? And then he goes on to show you where the greatest display of God's power was seen and made manifest. It was at the cross. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, 
The fullness of him who fills all in all. I mean, if we left right now, we'd be blessed. <laughs> that shows you. And I always said it like this. There's been a decapitated church for a long time. Jesus, we just pray that you do this. Jesus, we just pray that you do this. When Jesus is saying, I've already given you everything to get it done yourself. You notice how when in Mark chapter 4, the storm came and the boat was wobbling and the water was filling the boat? Do you notice how when they woke Jesus up from the stern that he was asleep and they said, Master, don't you care that we're perishing? Do something about this. What did Jesus do? He rebuked them. Yo, ye of little faith, why are you so fearful? And then how did he deal with the storm? Let's gather around this place. Father, we come to you in that mighty name. And he, didn't, they didn't, he didn't do that. He just spoke to the storm and said, hush, be still. And the Bible says that Peter, who was a trained fisherman, an expert fisherman, spent his entire life on the sea. He said, I've never seen the sea this calm in my entire life. That shows you something. Jesus came as an example. When I go and you are supernaturally connected to me, grafted in. Everybody say graft, grafted. When they graft a, a, a branch into a vine, into a tree, they have to take the, the, the branch that may be diseased or dead and they have to cut it in a certain, a certain way. And then the tree itself, the core of the tree, they have to inflict the same type of wound in it so that it can be perfectly merged together. We had a condition. We were, we were a dead branch, cut off from the power of God, come, cut off from the, from the promises of, of God, cut off from the commonwealth of Israel, the Bible says, far from God, children of wrath, the scripture says. And we, were, we, were, we had a condition called sin. Jesus, when he took when he went to that cross, Isaiah 53 says, he was wounded with the very same condition. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt. And by his stripes we were healed. So Jesus was wounded with the very same condition of sin that we had. I say had because in Christ you don't have it anymore. Why? You study agriculture. The vine had to be wounded in a certain way. To match the, the branch. And then when you would plug the branch into the vine, into the core of the tree, it would actually, engraftment literally means to plug one branch into the vine so that both can grow together. When the branch being us, a dead, diseased, sinful branch, was plugged in to Christ, the wounded Christ, it's not our disease that got on him. It's not our sin that got on him. It's, we didn't influence him. His life overwhelmingly took over our life. And then the Bible, the Bible says we became partakers of his resurrection power as a result of it. Everybody say partakers of his glory. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. The Bible says by the great and magnificent promises. There it goes again. I said it before. The epistles of Paul were designed in such a way to show you what is yours because you belong to Jesus? And then Peter says, by these great promises now, you have become, not you will become, as you study and get them in you, you have become partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption of this world. I mean, you know, we're just sinners. No, not anymore. You're not a sinner anymore. You've been saved by grace. You're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God's very, everything you say about you, if you can't say it about him, you shouldn't say it about you. If you can't say it about Jesus, you shouldn't say it about you. I'm just stupid. Can you say he's stupid? No. And the Bible says you have the mind of Christ. So how could you go around saying I'm stupid? How could you go around saying I'm a failure? Is he a failure? No. No. And through the, you've been grafted into Christ. You've become one with him. Whatever you say about yourself, you're actually, you're insulting God. 
Because God's made you a new creation and God didn't make an unrighteous creation. God didn't make a stupid new creation. God didn't make a failing new creation. He made a glorious new creation. 1 Peter 2, 9. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, God's very own possession, called to speak his light in a dark world. Hallelujah. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians. Now I'm going to get into my message. 1 Corinthians 1.30. It, it all ties in. 1 Corinthians 1.30. Paul speaking. But of God, you are in Christ Jesus. Everybody say that again. I'm in Christ Jesus. Yeah, get that. I'm going to have you confess that several times tonight. You got to get that in your head. You got you to gotta think on it. You know, Paul says... Be anxious for nothing. But then he doesn't say, you know, it's, it's, it's actually very irritating when you go and tell someone who's prone to anxiety or full of anxiety, hey, stop being anxious. They can't. How do I stop being anxious? Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And then he uses, he lists off a few things that tell you how to stop being anxious. Prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. But then that's where everybody ends. That's where most preaching stops on that passage in Philippians 4. But Paul says in verse 8, finally, brethren... Here's the masterpiece of how to stop being anxious. Whatever things are pure, whatever things are good, whatever is noble, whatever is true, whatever is noteworthy or excellent of praise, dwell on these things. That word dwell is to marinate in it. Marin like a piece of meat marinates in an olive oil and whatever seasoning bag. You have to marinate in that until it... Why do we marinate meat into olive oil and whatever seasoning, the rubber, whatever? Because we want that taste, that flavor to get into the meat. When you marinate in the word, the flavor of the word gets into you so that you carry the fragrance of Christ everywhere you go. And the devil notices there's a different scent in you and he learns to back off your way before he even stretches out his hand. When you marinate on, Paul's, uh, David said it this way. I knew that truth. I meditated on it until the fire burnt. Oh, hallelujah. I don't know how to get on fire for God. You meditate on the word, it's like adding wood to a fire. The fire will start burning in you. The, that victory spirit, you know, the spirit of the word is a spirit of faith. It's a spirit of victory. If you find yourself that, you, I don't feel like I have faith, get in the, the word and the spirit of faith will come on you and the spirit of victory will come on you so you won't be the one that looks like the third guy from the left on the evolution chart. You'll be the one that... Paul said, you will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint because the power of God will radiate in and through you. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are you in Christ Jesus who became for us. So we talked about our, we are in Christ Jesus. We've established that. But what are some things that belong to us because of being in Christ Jesus? Paul lists four things and we're going to do that tonight. Who became for us wisdom from God. Everybody say wisdom. Righteousness. Say righteousness. Sanctification. And redemption. That is it is written. If any man glories. Let him glory in the Lord. That's right. It's not, it's not by works of righteousness. You can't work your way up. To the things that being in Christ provides you with. You can't work your way up. No matter how much. Uh, a, a, a gazelle tries to be a lion, it just never makes the cut. It, you can tell it's, it's, not, it's not the same structure. The bones are different. The strength is different. No matter how hard you, that gazelle might try, it'll never become a lion. There has to be that new birth that takes place. The same thing goes for us. You can't stop sinning in your own strength. You can't, you can't access the wisdom of God by studying and becoming more intellectual or educated or studying books or whatever, or go and get four PhDs. The wisdom of God, the Bible says, comes only from above. So we're going to point number one. Of him are you in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. When you're in Christ Jesus, you, I, evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth always says this, that the moment you get saved, he's convinced and I'm convinced because it happened to me, your IQ level jumps. I really believe that. Because before I was saved, I was 
I was a hard, had a hard time memorizing anything. I had a hard time retaining information, apprehending, and, and even sorting information out, probably because of the drugs. But nonetheless, I had a hard time doing all that. When I got saved, I, I literally felt that my brain received like, you know when you, you jolt a car, you, you uh, jump start a car? I felt my brain get jump started by the Holy Ghost. And now when I read the word, it's like it just, it just sticks. It sticks on me. What I wasn't able to do when I went to Bible college, they, they, and I'm not saying this to brag on me, like it says, let him that glory is glory in the Lord. When I went to Bible college, when you enter in to Zion Bible Institute, or at the, now it's North Point, they make you do an assessment test that they make you do when you enter in year one and they, when you leave year four. And so it's not an easy test. It's a lot of Bible knowledge and theology that you have to know. I, I had studied the word for a solid, like, year before that and I was just just eating it all in and I'm I'm telling you it was supernatural I was able to retain everything so when I did the test I scored a hundred percent and the the guy that was grading it came to see me and he's like did you cheat because he's like there's only two people that scored a hundred percent and everyone else did pretty bad did you cheat I said no I didn't cheat He's like, how did you know the, because we have to go through the book of Acts, every chapter and what was in every chapter. How did you know what went through every, I don't know, it's just, I, I just, the Holy Ghost quickened it to my, to my mind. And he said, you know, the Holy Spirit said, I'll teach you everything and then I'll bring to remembrance everything that I've taught you. That's what happened. He was astonished. And then I was on the radar from then on out. <laughs> and I did well in Bible college. I had a good GPA. I didn't do good before I, go, I wasn't a good school student. I didn't study well. I didn't do well in, in math. I didn't do well in all those things. I, I was, you know, I did my best. Amen. <laughs> I did what, what, with whatever I had. But when I got saved, the wisdom of God supernaturally accelerated my comprehension level. And I was able, and I continue to be able to comprehend things. That happens when you get saved. And the Bible says, if you feel like you have no wisdom, you can ask God for wisdom. If you feel like you've not entered into that, you can ask God for wisdom, and He will give you the wisdom you need, and He won't hold anything back. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus was never at loss. He was never like lost, uh, lost or, or missing direction, confused. The Bible says when they had 5,000 people to feed, that Jesus Himself knew what He would do. He told Philip, what are we going to get bread? But he himself knew what he would do. He always knew what to do. Can you picture Jesus backed into a corner? Can you picture Jesus lost their words? Every time the Pharisees came to trap him in his words, he gave them an answer that got them to back off and say, you know what, D don't even try with this guy. Every time Jesus gave an answer, they backed off. The Bible says, and they questioned him no longer from that point onward. Because he made them look like fools. Why? Because he was operating by divine frequency, and they were on a human frequency. Well, we're in Christ Jesus. We have the mind of Christ. We have the wisdom of God at work in us. We operate at that same frequency. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you say, the guy who discovered the human genome was a Christian, spirit-filled Christian. Nobody was ever able to do that. DNA strand and everything. It was a Christian that came out and discovered that. God, and he credited God. He said, the Lord showed me it. Anyone ever? Obviously you do. Heavenly taste cookies. The wisdom for... There had to be divine wisdom to make that cookie. But the wisdom to get that, she said it. I was, I was sleeping, had a dream, wrote down the ingredients and everything on my pen and paper next to my bed. And the next morning I tested it out and boom, explosion in her business. They're all, I've seen them in the United States in places. They're all over the place. That's, that's soup, that capacity to come up with, the Bible says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and I find out knowledge of witty invented, inventions. That capacity to have a generational impacting idea is in you. It's in you. Because you're in Christ. So quit saying, I'm slow. Quit saying, I, you know, I never, never have good ideas. Maybe before you did it. 
But the Bible says we've put off the old men. Oh, hallelujah. We've been renewed in the spirit of our mind and we've put on the new man created in the image of Christ Jesus in righteousness and holiness. Notice how it says you're a new creation but you have to put on the new man. That's why it's important to get in the word. That's how you put on the new man. Daily you have to put him on. Daily. That's, what, that's how you get renewed into that image. Paul said in Rev Romans chapter 12, Be not conformed with this world, but be ye transformed through what? Through the renewing of your mind, so that you can prove to your generation what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You have to be renewed in your mind. The renewal takes place in the Word. 2 Corinthians 3.18 As we behold Him in the Word, we are transformed. There's that word transformed again. Metamorphosis. We are transformed into the very same image by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Do you know that Romans 8.29 says, When you were called, or rather it says, When you were predestinated, you were called to be conformed to the image of His Son. Conformed to look like Jesus, to talk like Jesus, to speak like Jesus, to move like Jesus. Brother Tupin, said, he quoted a scripture when he was preaching, what was it, last week or two weeks ago? And uh, it was in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 1 or 2 Peter, no, 2 Peter 1. And it talks about has his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And then he said words that were very simple, but they stuck out to me. Godliness means God-likeness. God-likeness. To be like God on the earth. The Bible says we are to imitate God as beloved children. When we're saying we need to be godly, we're saying we need to be like God on the earth. To carry not only, so everybody believes in the character part. Not only the character part, but the wisdom part and the power part too. You know, when they saw Paul in Malta, on the island of Malta, they were astonished and said, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. They thought that he was a God because of what he was doing by the wisdom of God and the power of God. I'm not saying you are a God, but I'm saying when the power of God comes alive in you, he makes you godly, godlike. And when the world sees the fruit that that bears, it gets them to scratch their head and say that person isn't operating on the same level as everyone else. That doesn't excite anybody. Man, the sun must have zapped people today. Everybody looks red because they burnt, didn't put sunscreen on, and <laughs> burnt your skin and your noggin. Fries you. Anyways, God's word's exciting to me, so. Number one, wisdom. James chapter 3 says the wisdom that comes from above is full of good fruits. In Christ, we. We don't have access to that wisdom. We have that wisdom already in us. And the Bible says it's not a wisdom that brings forth just good words. Oh, he's wise. Why? Because he speaks like Shakespeare? Because he speaks in King, J King James language? That doesn't make you wise. There's a lot of people that have PhDs and they're dull. I think the last three years have shown us that. A lot of people that have white coats and labs and they're dull. Everything we went through was because of a knucklehead and a white coat in a lab somewhere in Wuhan, China. Oops. Could you imagine? That's like, that's probably the worst oopsie since Adam ate that apple. <laughs> Seriously. Oops. Of course, some people don't believe that happened. But anyways, it wasn't bat soup. <laughs> Say wisdom. So it's not in big words, it's in great works. When they were astonished at Jesus' wisdom, they said, where did this man's wisdom come from? That such great works are performed by his hands. Proverbs chapter 3 and 4, when you have time, I'd study it. Just those two chapters. Because it shows you and lists off everything, that was the byproducts of wisdom. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. Her profits are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. And it goes on to say, all her ways are pleasant and all her paths are peace. 
In her right hand is riches and honor, and in her left hand is length of days. Hallelujah. That means when you operate by divine wisdom, it not only will it attract uh, riches and honor, but the Bible says it'll give you a long life. There's things you can do outside of the wisdom of God that will shorten your life, and there's things that you can do inside the wisdom of God that will prolong your life. The Bible says the fear of the Lord prolongeth your life, prolongeth days. So the wisdom of God is not this theoretical wisdom. It's something that brings forth substantial results that gets your generation to, to be baffled. Number two, righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. righteousness. Of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who hath become for us righteousness. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become what? The righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus didn't die so that you, can, you still have to battle out sin the rest of your life and work your way up to heaven. Jesus died so that he can impute, deliver, hand over the very thing that he is, righteous, into your standing. Everything he did, he did it to credit your account. He was already righteous. What he did was to credit to your account. So that you wouldn't, it, first of all, it's impossible. The Bible says it wasn't by works of righteousness that we gain favor with God. It was by his mercy and by his grace that we have become righteous in Christ Jesus. There's no amount of money that you could have paid God off. There's no bribe. There's no education. There's nothing like that that could have made you more righteous. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I, I drill this a lot wherever I preach the whole righteousness consciousness because if you are a Christian and you only think your sins are forgiven but you still carry the stink of your past life and sin nature in you, you're never going to step out in boldness. You're never going to have the bold faith required to take dominion on the earth. You're always going to be wondering, oh, does God hear me? Like when you pray. If you don't understand your righteousness, you won't be able to pray right. Because it's only the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. Well, if you think you're unrighteous, you're not going to pray fervently, and you're not going to pray effectively, and you'll never have much, many results, if any. That's why Hebrews 9 and 10 talks about what the blood of Jesus did for us. It says, not through the blood of goats, nor through the blood of bulls, but by his own blood, he entered into the most holy place, and now he has obtained an eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 10, 19 says, therefore, let us have boldness to enter into that same holy place by the blood of Jesus. I don't get bold to pray because I had a good week last week. I don't, I'm not bold to pray because, you know, I gave a little more in the offering last week. I'm bold to pray because what the blood speaks on my behalf the blood has declared me righteous the blood has declared me holy pure without blame without spot I can come before the father holy in his sight and ask anything and he said I'll hear you and give it to you so if you don't understand your righteousness in Christ you're always going to pray those cheap timid prayers and then forget that when you're dealing with the devil the devil knows. That's why the seven sons of Sceva got chased out. We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Paul? Paul I know, the demon replied. Because he's in Christ. <laughs> there it is again. Paul I know. Why did he recognize Paul? Because Paul was in Christ. Paul I know. And Jesus I know. Who the heck are you? It doesn't matter if you call yourself a Christian or if you don't understand that you now have right standing with God. You know, righteousness is a legal thing. It's not a feeling. I don't feel righteous. It doesn't matter if you feel righteous or not. If you're in Christ, you're legally declared like a judge ordered. You're, I don't feel innocent. doesn't matter. You got declared innocent. The Bible says he took our certificate of sin. He took the, the record of wrongdoings that we had expunged it, took it out of the way, pressed delete on the computer system of heaven and said, now I give you the keys of the kingdom to beat back the forces of darkness. My rec Say this, my record is expunged. 
I heard a preacher say he was out um, at, a, at a zoo or a safari out in Oklahoma. And while he was in his, he had his family in a van. And they were, you know, like at Park Safari, the, the animals come and they just feed right off your hand. That's the type of safari it was. And so they were driving and there was this llama that was going out to, to eat from his daughter's hand in the back part of the van. And um, the daughter was like scared, didn't want to feed. So he said, why are you afraid of, he told his daughter, why are you afraid of that llama? I ain't, no, I ain't afraid of no llama. And so the llama must have heard him, he said, because he came to my side. And then the llama, start, the llama started to feed off of, Marcy, this one's for you. The llama started to feed off the guy's, um, he had bought a big like bucket of feed and stuff. And then all of a sudden, the llama like eyes went open and then he, he sneezed. <laughs> And everything he had ingested just splattered all over the van on their clothes, on the floor, on the rug. It was a hot mess in there. And so this was his own van. He went home the next day, washed the entire van. I mean, he cleaned it. He did everything. He brought it to a detailer. They tried. So the, the rug was clean. There's no stain, no nothing. They got everything out, but the scent of what that llama deposited in that van never seemed to leave. It was still there, and it was... It was something, he said. And so after like three, four months, he's like, I can't, I can't, they're traveling evangelists. I can't travel in this anymore. It stinks. So he put it up for sale and the guy came to buy and he said, there's something that smells in here. So it smells like strawberries, actually. He ended up selling it and bought a brand new van. That's how a lot of Christians are. They allow the devil to get in their heads like that llama got into the car and sneeze all over their, their consciousness. Bring them down with accusations. Bring them down with all kinds of uh, allegations, false allegations against them. Br bringing, them up, bringing up their past, everything they did, every, every wrongdoing, all the mistakes that they did that we regretted. Constantly berating them. And Christians allow that thought to continue to dwell in them. And they think Jesus just came to clean the thing up, but the smell's still there. The smell is still there. Jesus' blood, that's the difference between the blood of Jesus and the blood of a bull. The blood of the bull, it cleaned the car up, but the scent was still there. The blood of Jesus cleans the car out and removes the scent so that there's no, the Bible says, we now know, have no more consciousness of our sin. I have a righteousness conscious now. I have a clean conscience before God, Paul said. Think of it, Paul. Remember murderer Paul? Paul who took Christians, men and women, committed them to prison and executed them, held the clothes of those that were martyring Stephen. That Paul in his letter in 1 Corinthians 7 says, I've not wronged anybody. Years later, he's writing to the Corinthians and he said, I've not wronged anybody. How could Paul, who did such atrocious things, write years later, I've not wronged anybody? Unless, of course, that scent had left. Because he understood. See, your understanding of the blood of Jesus is going to limit. Is gonna, if you have a poor understanding of the blood of Jesus, it will limit what that, that blood will do for you. It's not that the, blower, the blood loses its strength or power. It's that if you have a poor understanding or inaccurate knowledge of the blood, it will limit its efficacy in your life. Faith is accurate knowledge of the Word of God. And so if you don't have accurate knowledge of what the blood means and signifies for you, it's always going to hold you back. The devil will always make you a victim and always be able to sow those thoughts of condemnation. That's why Paul was able to say, I know what the blood did, and there's therefore no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. You're 100% righteous the moment you get saved. You cannot grow in righteousness. You cannot grow in righteousness. You can grow in holiness. You can grow and improve in faith. You can grow in love, the Bible says. You can grow in the word. But you cannot grow in righteousness. Because Romans 5.17 says that we have received the gift of righteousness. It's a gift and it came fully packaged already. Fully loaded. Like when you buy a, a car, fully loaded, you can't, they, they don't even offer another feature. It's fully loaded. That's how right, when God gave you the gift of righteousness, he gave it fully loaded. There's no second class righteousness. 
There's no economy righteousness. You know, when you go on a plane, you got first class and then the rest. You ever fly first class? I haven't yet, but I've seen them as I pass by. They got the blanket already. You got to ask for it. And then it takes an hour to get there. And by that time, you're already in Toronto. You got a uh, first class. They already got the blanket. They already got the pillow. They already got the headset. They already got food. They got, you know, they're already pouring drinks in their cups and all that. They're just fully loaded. Treated differently. You go look in economy behind the veil. <laughs> it's a different story. You got some kid yanking at somebody's chair, pulling their hair, snot all over the back, uh, back of the television set. You ask for a pillow. Oh, sir, we'll get that for you. They forget three times throughout the flight. Then they close the veil, and it's like, we're, you're not even worthy to peek in. Keep your eyes closed. That's how some Christians are. They think they got an economy-level righteousness. That, you know, the preacher, he's, he's got first class. Oh, he's, he's, he's got a better... You know what? I'm going to ask pastor to pray because he has a better standing with God. no. It doesn't matter if you've won a hundred million souls to the Lord over 80 years of ministry and you've lived in purity since your youth. The moment you get saved, if you live, that, that thief on the cross was declared 100% righteous the moment he put his faith in Christ. No matter his, 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 the verdict that man had placed on him, no matter the fact that he was, about, he was being executed, at that moment, he didn't have to work anything up. He didn't have to improve on anything. He just received. And at that moment, the preacher who lived his entire life for Christ and that thief on the cross obtained the same first class righteousness that heaven has to offer. There's no economy righteousness. It's first class. First class. That's why you don't have to. This is where you have a lot of Christians that call pastor. Can you keep me in? Why? Why? You have the Catholic system. Go and, you know, we, I got to go talk to the priest so he can talk to God. Or better yet, we need to talk to Mary. Mary, she don't hear you. I was on a television show in Dominican Republic when I was there in 2016. And the, the guy tried to like, he saw I was a young preacher. And so he tried, he was a Catholic, it was a Catholic news station or whatever, but they were, they had me on because we were adv advertising our crusades. So we agreed on, we want people to w be one to Jesus, but he like tried to trip me up at the end, uh, near the end of the broadcast. And he says, so do you guys pray to saints? I said, no. He's like, why not? He's like in John chapter two, Mary went to Jesus and said, we have no wine. And Jesus looked at Mary and said, you know, it's not my hour right now. And then Mary looked to the servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. You know, Mary interceded for those people. And I said, so, so we can pray to Mary. That's what he was saying. We can pray to Mary. She can be our, in, our mediator. Because it turned water into wine then. It can do miracles now. I said, okay, Mary's dead or alive? Was Mary dead or alive then? Alive. Is she dead or alive now? Dead. Well, there you go. You can't go to Mary and ask for favors anymore. She's dead. And then he was like, oh. I mean, it's, it's a very simple thing. Was she dead or alive then? She was alive. Is she dead or alive now? Dead. She's in heaven. Case closed. And even if, there, even if Mary was taken, which she's not, and I repeat that, she is not. But even if she was taking requests, why would you go to her when the Bible says we have Jesus as our mediator before the Father and he's the one that tore the veil from top to bottom so that we can come. We don't have to outsource our prayer. We can come boldly before God himself and ask what things soever we want. Why would I want someone else to do my praying when I have direct... If I had some multimillionaire on the phone right now, and you were there. And I say, he wants to talk to you. No, no, no. You talked to him for me. Why? He wants to talk to you. God doesn't want to talk to everyone but you. He wants to talk to you. He wants the request from your mouth. He wants you to turn your faith loose. And you're able to do that because of righteousness. And I said it before. You have to carry a righteous conscience. What does that mean? Remind yourself of this. Every day. 
You should look in the mirror and say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't feel righteous. It doesn't matter what you feel. Well, I don't look righteous. Sometimes I wake up and I don't look righteous. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I look like or I feel like. I am righteous because the Bible can't lie. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Has he not said it and will he not do it? If God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And any devil that tries to come and discourage you, you can, that's why the Bible says we take every thought captive to the obedience of the word of God. We line things up. You should put your thoughts through the filter of the word. Does it, does it filter through every single filter Paul lists out in Philippians 4 8? Is it true about you? No? Then it has no business in your mind. That's why the Bible says don't tolerate it. Cast down the strongholds of your mind and bring your mind and your confession and your emotions into alignment with the divine will of God. I heard a preacher say this today and I love it. He said, until you bring your emotions and your will and your thought life to be dominated by God's word, you will never have victory. You have, that's why the Bible says we are washed by the water of the word. Well, you Christians are brainwashed. Amen. I am brainwashed. I'm the most brainwashed person there is. Oh, man. And it ain't propaganda. It's the truth. It ain't propaganda. Jesus said, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Which leads me to point number three. Sanctification. This is like, I'm having fun tonight because it's like more of a teaching. Sanctification. The Bible says he has become for us sanctification. What is sanctification? It means to be set apart, made holy unto the Lord. When you come to Christ and you abide in him and you're supernaturally connected by mystery of redemption and Christ liveth in you, that sanctifying power now lives in you. Romans chapter 6 says this, that when Christ was raised from the dead, we also were raised with him so that we can walk in newness of life. So not righteousness is our legal standing before God. Sanctification by the Holy Ghost is the power he gives you to live a holy and clean life and live out that righteousness. So I'm legally righteous before God, but then God gives us his sanctifying power, namely the Holy Spirit, so we can live out that righteousness. So people get this wrong because they think, well, I'm, I've sinned today, so I'm not righteous. And I'm, oh, I'm doing good today. I am righteous. I sinned today. I'm not righteous. And they have this seesaw battle. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. You are righteous because of the finished work of the cross. And when you're truly born again, you're going to have a desire to be sanctified. So all those people that say, oh, I'm righteous, doesn't matter how I live. I can live however I want. Whether I had a preacher say it uh, last week. He said... Um, he said, it, God loves you no matter what you do. If you leave this place go, and, and go out and sin and do everything you want to do in the, in the flesh, God loves you all the same. If you go out and you do good, God loves you all the same. I beg to differ, brother. Because the Bible says you should be holy in all your conduct, even as your Father in heaven is, is holy. So yes, we are righteous in, 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 in the legal term of it, perfectly made right before God, but there's another, there's another thing that happens in redemption, and that's called sanctification. Whereby the deeds of the flesh, the lusts of the flesh, the corruption of the flesh, the DNA of Adam is day by day being put under, and the DNA of Christ is giving pre preeminence in your life. Paul said he wasn't exempt from it. He said, lest I should be disqualified, I bring my body into subjection to the will of the Spirit, lest I should be disqualified. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, if you are carnally minded, you can go on and live life however you want. It is death and it will produce death. But if you are spiritually minded, spirit led, it will produce life and peace. And then Romans 8 continues on in saying that if we live according to the flesh, we will die in the flesh. But if we, and when he says live, he means habitually continue the practice of sinning. Deliberately keep on sinning. 
If you deliberately keep on sinning, the Bible says, knowing that the truth, knowing what Jesus did, knowing the sacrifice of the cross, the Bible says there no longer remains a sacrifice for you. If you deliberately keep on doing it and have no intention to go back. You know, grace, amen. Grace is not an excuse or exemption card. You flash God every time you sin. You say, remember grace? Grace is actually a spiritual empowerment. God gives the newborn believer to go and sin no more. It's not an excuse to keep on sinning. It's power to stop sinning. You can stop sinning. Well, I don't know how I'm ever going to stop. Yeah, in the flesh, you're never going to stop. Romans 8 says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live. So it's by the Spirit. By the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the flesh. I quoted it before, 2 Peter 1.3. As his divine power is given to us all things that pertains to life and godliness. To be like God in holiness, God has already given his divine power to accomplish that. God has not called anybody to do anything that he has not supernaturally empowered you to do. If he said be holy as I am holy, it's because he has power in Christ to be holy as he is holy. People get confused on this. They say, well, you're preaching that we can be perfect. Yeah, you can. You can. I believe that it's an actual, it, you can actually keep to the path of perfection. I'm not, that, that doesn't mean you, you, might not have a day, you might have a day where, you know, you have an outburst of wrath or whatever. Or maybe you stubbed your toe and you said some things you shouldn't have said. But I believe that you can keep to the path of perfection. Meaning if you stubbed your toe and said some things you shouldn't have said, you can repent. A, a true born-again person is, even if they fall momentarily, it's not going to be this long 15-year cycle, yeah, you know, I really fell off the rail, but grace, amen. No, someone who's truly born again, the moment they slip off, I, I can tell you because this is my, my experience, I have such an urge of conviction, an urgent conviction that rises up. You're, you're in the wrong, and then I get in the right, and I keep to the path of perfection. But perfection is not a destination. Perfection is a pathway that you keep to. The Bible calls it the highway of holiness. That's why Proverbs says if a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up again. I believe that you can hit the point. You know, people are like, how many of you know we sin every day? You can get to the point where you don't sin every day. You can get to the point where you're not operating by the flesh, you're operating by the Spirit. Galatians 5 says, so if you live in the Spirit, you should also walk by the Spirit and no longer fulfill the desires of the flesh. And he lists off the desires of the flesh, and he says, those who practice these things, I tell you again, as I've told you before, you will not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning you ain't going to make heaven. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of a regenerate Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit that's truly been born again is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's why the Bible says, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but you're now under grace. The Bible says, don't you know whomever you present your body as a slave to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of Christ leading to, of righteousness leading to life? What you, the lifestyle you engage with proves who's your, who you're enslaved to. The Bible says we were freed from sin and we've become slaves of Christ. Hallelujah. Nobody had to counsel me to stop smoking. Nobody ever told me stop smoking. Nobody ever told me stop drinking. Nobody ever told me stop doing marijuana. Nobody ever told me that. I got in the Word and the purifying factor of the Word and then in prayer, the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. It, the Bible says that He trims off the branches that don't bear fruit. And then the branches that do bear fruit, He prunes so that can bear even more fruit. I prof lift your hands all over this place. I prophesy every branch in your life, branch of sin, branch of, 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 of 
poor habit or whatever, things that are keeping you from walking in the fullness of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, it gets trimmed now in Jesus' name. It gets severed. Every planting that the enemy has put in your life that my father has not planted, it gets uprooted today in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Number four, and I finish with this, is redemption. He has become for us redemption. This is my favorite one. That's why I saved it for last. I, don't, I usually don't save the best for last. I'm the type of guy, my wife is like that. When there's like food, and you know, she'll have her filet mignon or whatever, and she'll go and eat all the veggies first. And maybe it's healthier to do that, but anyway, she, she eats all the veggies first, eats everything, you know, bread, whatever. And then finally at the last, she'll go for her filet mignon. I'm the opposite. When I'm hungry, my taste buds are highly receptive. I want to w spend that on the filet mignon, and then afterwards, I'll move on to the rest, you know? She's the opposite of me. She'll literally clean her whole plate, and then finally get to, like, the best thing. Like, if there's, like, a lobster on her plate, and then a filet mignon lobster, you guys think I, like, eat like a king every night. You know, it's like lobster. What are you guys eating? <laughs> I'm the opposite. I go for the but tonight, I guess I pulled a carry. Redemption. Turn with me to Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. And verse 12. He has become for us redemption. Colossians 1, 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. I don't feel qualified. I'm sorry you ripped that part of your Bible, but it's there. <laughs> Who has, doesn't say who will qualify us when we make heaven one day, amen? Who has qualified us? I think Christians would do good if they went through a grade three English again and learned their past, present, and future tense verbs. It doesn't say he's going to qualify us. It says he has qualified us. You're qualified. Who has qualified us for what? To be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. The light connotes revelation knowledge. So he's qualified you, but you only become a partaker when these things become known and received by you. Jesus said, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So we're qualified. Doesn't matter. You can have two Christians. One living in absolute victory, the one being smacked around by the devil. Both are equally qualified to partake of the inheritance. One understands their redemption and the authority that's been given to them. The other one... Just wishes, hopeful thinking. Oh God, one day. God, now get this. God sympathizes with your tears. But God is not moved by tears. God is moved by faith and faith alone. And faith begins where the will of God is known and acted on. So if you don't know these things belong to you, it's like a... You know that, that holiday they celebrate Juneteenth? You know what Juneteenth is about? The Emancipation Proclamation was signed in the North. Texas only got it like two years later when everything... So there were slaves in Texas that remained slaves for two full years because they hadn't heard the news. The North was free. The South, many, many remained as slaves for two full years when legally... The prison cell was open. They could march on free. They had equal rights with everyone else. But because they didn't know and they didn't hear, they couldn't act on it, and they stayed, they stayed as slaves. But then when the news came, <laughs> they left, and they didn't go back. That's what a lot of Christians are. They're, they've been made free, but they're still sitting in their prison cell. The doors are open. And they're just sitting in the prison cell waiting. One day God's going to send Jesus again for them. Jesus already did everything he has to do to make you walk in total victory over sin, sickness, Satan, and poverty and lack. It's up to you now to read. Where's my Bible? To read the document that shows your emancipation. That's why people that come to me, I need deliverance. I need deliverance. The easiest way to be delivered and to stay delivered and stay free. Jesus outlined it in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to, de to proclaim deliverance to the captives. You actually don't pray for deliverance. 
You preach deliverance to the captives. It's when people come into the knowledge of what I'm saying here that the light goes on, and when light goes on, darkness leaves for free. That's why Paul constantly calls it the light of the gospel. When the light of the gospel comes on, is triggered in your life, darkness leaves for free because the dominion of light over darkness is instant and it's unquestionable. Unquestionable. So I, 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 don't, I, don't, even, I don't even pray for deliverance. I preach deliverance. That's how I got healed. OCD, eight years. Bound by the devil. Held captive by him. I get saved at 20 years old in 2012. Still had OCD because all I knew was that Jesus wanted to forgive me of sin and that was it. So what, I, what you don't have taught and preached to you out of the word of God, you'll never partake of. I'll repeat that. What you don't have taught and preached to you out of God's word, you'll never partake of it. So I, I had been taught and preached to my entire life that Jesus forgives sin. But I never heard that by his stripes we're healed. I stayed sick, OCD, for months before Pastor Steve sat me down and explained that, uh, you know, it wasn't Paul's thorn in the flesh. It wasn't, you know, God chastising me or disciplining me or God just leaving me in this satanic bondage to teach me a lesson. You know, you live so, he taught me, he cleared all that clutter out. And then when I was listening to Evangelist Jonathan, he started to preach out of Isaiah 53. I never heard that before. And it was at that moment, that light, I didn't, nobody prayed for me. I was in my living room chair with Cheeto dip on my face. <laughs> not approachable to God, not presentable at all. But when I heard the truth, ye shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. When I heard the truth and I saw it, I had a vision of Jesus tied to a wooden pole. And he was taking lashes on his back. And he was bloodied all over his face. And he looked at me and he said, I did this so you can be made whole. No prayer required. At that moment, I said, well, then it's true and it's true for me because God doesn't have favorites. At that moment, electricity came from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. That was in 2012. It's 2022, 10-year anniversary of God setting me free, keeping me free, and then working in me to set others free by that same glorious power. Oh, hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can stand up on your feet. I feel like this is a good place. Say, I am redeemed. I was going to read it. Colossians 1.13. Jesus has delivered us. There it is again. I just want to be delivered. I, just be, I, just, I didn't need to be delivered. Did you not get the memo? You is delivered. <laughs> didn't you hear? I just need to... He has delivered us. Does my translation say something? No, there it is. He has delivered us. From what? From some of, God, of the devil's power, but... You know, we're still in this earthen vessel. He still has some... No. When, when Adam sinned, Satan took the keys of authority. When Jesus was obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross... He took those keys back. That's why when John beheld him on the island of Patmos, he said, I am, he beheld Jesus, and he saw Jesus not as some bruised and battered thing, as the lion of Judah that had conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he said, I am he who was dead, but I live, and I hold the keys of death, hell, and the grave. The devil doesn't get to decide when you die. The devil doesn't get to decide any of that. Jesus holds the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Hebrews 2.14 says, He, Jesus, partook of flesh and blood that through his death he might deliver us from him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He destroyed him that, has the, that had the power of death, that is the devil, and release us from the fear of death who all our lifetime were subject to its bondage. He partook of flesh and blood, died a sinner's death, so that we might be freed from him who had the power of death, that Satan might be destroyed, and that we might be released from his captivity. Do you know that a Vancouver police officer cannot come here and arrest you? He doesn't have jurisdiction to do that here. 
He doesn't, he, it's not his jurisdiction. He has no legal authority to do that here. A Vancouver, uh, can't have a guy from Kenya walk in and say, sir, you got to come with me. Under whose authority? Kenya. I don't submit to that authority. Can't do it. Back off. And if they try anything, you can call your own police guards and they'll come and arrest them. That's why we got angels. The angel of the Lord encamps around them that fear him and he delivers them from all their destruction. So the Bible says he has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, Satan's kingdom. We're no longer under his jurisdiction. We're not, uh, no longer under his reign of terror. We're no longer under his authority. He's got no... Jesus said in Matthew 28, All authority, say all authority, all authority. and all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That means the devil has no authority and no power in heaven and on earth. And by redemption, we share in the authority of Christ so that we're no longer in a place to be held captive by the devil. Even a step further, not only are we not in a place to be held captive by the devil, we have an anointing by the Spirit of God to go and set other captives free from his reign of terror. That's what I do as an evangelist. I just proclaim to people, hey, the day of your prison cell being closed ended 2,000 years ago. You can walk on free. You can march on out and step into the liberty of the children of God. The laws of the Spirit, the Bible says, Romans 8, 2, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free. There it is again, past tense. That's why I said Paul's letters are legal documents showing you what belongs to you in your inheritance. Has set me free from the laws of sin and death. Satan's kingdom has two laws, sin and death. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has removed you from that kingdom and planted you into a new kingdom that can never be shaken, that can never be moved. That's why Paul was so bold to say, now God is on my side. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my helper. If God be for me, who can be against me? Don't fear them, little children. You've overcome them. For greater is he that lives in you than he that is in the world. This is what redemption did for you. You're not... You're not at a disadvantage in life. You're not subject to the devil. You're not at his mercy. You're at a great advantage in life. He's subject to you. He's at your mercy. And it's about time the body of Christ no longer shows that red-tailed devil any mercy. Tolerating him in your house. I said all this so that there could be a holy aggravation that rises in your spirit. Quit tolerated him in your house, in your family, in your children, in your body, in your finances. you got to rise up and say, enough is enough. I'm the child of Abraham. I'm a child of God. I've been bought into a new kingdom. I've been bought by the precious blood of a lamb that was without spot and wrinkle. I'm not putting up with this one more day. You've come close enough, devil. Today, you'll flee. Hallelujah. 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 We need bold Christians. Amen. I ain't putting up with it. Elisha, they sent people to arrest him. If I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. Oh, you came to arrest me? Okay. No. If I be a man of God. Say that if you're a man. If I be a man of God. If you're a woman, say, if I be a woman of God. So it should be an insult to you that the devil even knocked on your door. Do you know who you're messing with? I'm in Christ. So I go back to what I started with. 2 Corinthians 12. I know a man in Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Now you understand why Paul said, I know a man in Christ. He didn't say, I know a man apart from Christ. I don't know, I don't know a man who knew Christ. I know a man in Christ. I don't just know Jesus. I have Jesus on the inside. That's why I love that old song. It's Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a glorious change in my life. It's Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. What a change in my life. Hallelujah. That's why there's anointing on that. It's God who is at work in you and through you to accomplish his good pleasure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands all over this place. Father, I thank you. As you've instructed me to teach on this tonight, 
that your seed is implanted in their hearts. That it's going to change their hearts, change their minds, change their thoughts, change their perspectives, and transform them into the image of Christ by the Spirit of the Lord. In Jesus' name, I thank you that from today, everything is different. Just like Hannah, nothing was different on the outside, but everything was different on the inside, and then things changed on the outside. Father, I thank you that this message is not falling on the wayside. It didn't fall on the shallow ground. It falls on fertile soils, fertile hearts, and it's going to produce fruit, 30, 60, and 100-fold fruit in Jesus' mighty name.